Today I have with me M. Curtis McCoy. M. Curtis is an entrepreneur, a personal development coach, a motivational speaker, best-selling author, and the founder of Newswire Magazine. Curtis, thank you for being with me today. How are you? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on, on your uh, podcast today. Yes, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. So I'm curious, Curtis, how did you start your journey in entrepreneurship and the work that you're doing? So I've, I've owned a whole bunch of different companies, you know, like a lot of kids starting out with a lawnmower at 13 years old or whatever, but I, I've launched you know, everything from a telecommunications company with over 250,000 customers monthly. I owned a cosmetic medical laser clinic, a pharmaceutical company manufacturing bioidentical injectable research peptides. Um, you know, at a Christian clothing company, quite a few different businesses. We had a, we had a uh, nutritional supplement co company that was supplying uh, GNC and 24 hour fitness, better, bo or, uh, better bodies, quite a few different, you know, different gyms and stuff. But basically the, the way that I got into the personal branding was from the mistakes of launching these companies We had, we had companies that were sometimes seven figure a month, you know, multi-million dollar companies very, being very successful. We'd build them up, you know, have massive traffic, huge customer base, and then sell the company or close the company or whatever happened, you know, maybe with, with best cellular, we had a quarter million customers a month. Then there was the Sprint T-Mobile merger back uh, three or four years ago here that basically put a ton of the mom and pop stores out of business, including some of the larger ones like ours. And every time I, I was having to start from scratch again, building a new brand. And a lot of successful entrepreneurs do that where they don't, you know, they want to stay out of the light, stay out of the limelight, not be, not have people focus on them or whatever. So they'll build up a very successful brand, but they don't know about doing that personal brand where people know, like, and trust you as the business owner. And then the next company that you start or the next, whatever it is, um, say like Richard Brunson, for example, starting Virgin Media, Virgin Records, Virgin Galactic, Virgin Airlines, he can start anything now. And because people know him and know that they're successful companies, it's, it's just automatically successful. So that's, that's the biggest thing that I've learned and started about 2018 was when I really started working on the personal brand and now doing consulting and helping other, other entrepreneurs and companies build their brands as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious, like you've ventured into sort of different industries that are not, they're not specifically related. Um, how, how did you find that experience? The way that I got into multiple different businesses like this is actually advice that I would give to any young entrepreneur that's trying to get started where whether it was the pharmaceutical company, the, you know, the weight loss business we had up in Denver, all these different companies, we would, we'd find a need that needed to be filled, some kind of a, a need in the marketplace, provide a solution at a reasonable price where, where your target audience can afford the price. If you're, if you're solving a problem for somebody, it's easy to, it's easy to get to business. Too many entrepreneurs start out their own companies and, you know, they've created some new widget, some new product, some new service that people don't know that they need, either don't know, don't need, or don't know that they need. And it's a train wreck trying to sell it where like our phone company, we had, we started that back when all the, all the prepaid companies were 50, $60 a month. We start, we launched a $15 a month cell phone plan, you know, pennies on the dollar we're making, losing money on some of the customers, but quarter million customers a month, because we had because we, we solved the need there of having prepaid wireless that was, that was cheap, affordable, and also used all the carriers. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think entrepreneurs, um, a superpower is really to be able to detect the problem that they're trying to solve and then solve it in a way that others haven't solved it before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very much. Or solve it in the same way, but be, but be more competitive or have a better brand. Uh, you can yeah. have, just like the phone companies, there are, well, I mean, there's over 300 phone companies you can still go to today for prepaid wireless. Yeah. So you don't have to be a unique, you don't have to start something completely different if you're solving a problem, but you fit a certain customer niche or you, you're you known and known, liked it and trusted by a certain group of people, you automatically have that customer base without, without having to start something new, just solve a problem and do it well. That's true. That's true. Yeah, and it's really about uh, also focusing about like what is the customer avatar? Like who is your ideal customer? Yeah. Who are you building this for? Creating this for? Providing the service option for? Yeah. 
That's such a good thing you mentioned because so many people want to be, you know, I, I consult, help out new entrepreneurs getting started. And often I'll ask, okay, what is, who's your target customer? Who's your, you know, what is your customer, your target avatar? How old are they? What's their income level? What's their education level? Do they have kids? Are they married? They go, well, I, you know, basically say a new speaker, you know, trying to get into motivational speaking, whatever, and getting paid to speak. Who's your target client? Who is the person in the audience that you want to serve? Well, you know, I can kind of talk to anybody about anything. That's my blessing is I, that's my gift is I can just really connect with anybody. Nobody's going to hire that guy because you're not solving a problem for anybody. You're just getting up there and talking. But if you've got that niche, that, that target avatar, like you mentioned, that really helps out a lot to be able to connect with those people you want to serve. Yeah, that's true. I heard the saying that said like, you know, if you're, if you're talking to everybody, you'll be serving nobody. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and like, I'd like to go there. Like, what do you think is um, like the biggest problem or issue that prevents entrepreneurs from really being able to zone in on that target market, on that ideal client avatar? Because I think it's something that a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with. I, I think probably a fear of not having a, a large enough audience. Mm-hmm. But you figure how many... I mean, how many people are in the earth, on, on the earth living today? I, I'd have to Google that, but there is no possibility. I don't care how big your business is, how famous you are. You know, you could have something that you could be selling oxygen and there is no way that you could possibly serve every customer alive. So yeah, don't worry about niching down too much, but that's the biggest fear for most people is, well, I don't want to be too specific. And um, I, I'm, so I've been talking to a client recently who is, the same kind of thing. She was trying to help women, you know, overcome adversity, whether that was abuse or addiction or whatever the problem was. But it, originally it was just, she wanted help struggling women. And so she went on for a couple of years spending literally tens of thousands of dollars on credit cards, trying to figure out how to, how to get people to, to, to buy her course, follow her program, buy her books, these kind of things. And she's going along and, and did not serve anybody specifically. So that's one of the things that we've been working on together is figuring out who is that customer. Literally, you serve one customer. She is a 40 year old, 40 old accountant that's trying to get out of a, you know, a loveless abusive marriage, whatever. When you when you niche down to that specific individual person, you talk to one person in the audience, there's a whole bunch of other people on earth that are in that exact identical situation. You could literally, if she said, okay, my target client is named Susan there'd be enough people to serve that were going through exactly what she's trying to do that had the name Susan, you know, whatever that, you don't have to niche down that specific, but, but uh, looks like she's getting some better traffic now, better, better connection with people now that she started niching down and getting, figure out exactly who that customer was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, and it's also, it's great for entrepreneurs to have someone to work with, a mentor that can really help guide them, especially when it comes to personal branding, because it's definitely an area that, we haven't really been exposed to. If you are a new entrepreneur, you know, you, you don't know a whole lot about personal branding. And I think that we tend to also compare ourselves <laughs> to other people who are maybe further along in the journey. And, yeah. you know, we start getting a little bit of an imposter syndrome or feeling like, you know, we're not yet good enough to, 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 to be able to do the things that we see other people doing. And I'm curious, um, what are the, some of the limiting beliefs that you see in people that you have coached or are coaching um, when it comes to like new entrepreneurs? I think the biggest thing, I, I'm going to share not what I'm, what I've seen other people as much, but just kind of, kind of something that I dealt with because everybody deals with it, but it's that lack of feeling like, you know, basically the imposter syndrome. I grew up in an abusive household, literally my dad one time, um, you know, been beating on me for hours, backhanded me knocked me down beside the bathroom, beside the toilet in the bathroom, you know, tell me you're, you're a waste of skin, you're a waste of oxygen, left the room, came back in with the 357 pistol, set it on the counter and told me to do the world a favor. And so I went through, like all of us, we've got, you know, that's a, that's kind of a heart wrenching story that makes for a good podcast clip, but we all deal with junk that, whether that's, you know, a loved one, Loved them passing away. Somebody saying something, maybe your mom or dad or somebody said something, somebody you really look up to said something that just broke your heart as a kid and it really stuck with you. Um, 
being cheated on, having a spouse leave you, whatever it was, we all deal with stuff that is that makes us look down on ourselves or feel like we're like we're not good enough or somebody else is better. But just realizing that you were created in the image of the God that created the entire universe. So by default, you're automatically amazing. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it's true. It's true. It's uh, sometimes those limiting beliefs have been downloaded <laughs> to us and not by, you know, not by us, but by others that, you know, yep. that, that have been in our environment or family or friends or, you know, like it's, and it's like unshackling those on unlim- those limiting beliefs and really understanding that, that, that we are very, very much separate, you know, like having limiting beliefs is truly what makes us have that separateness right because if we were looking at our core and our essence and our soul and our heart and our spirit yeah we are enough we are enough and it's uh it's it's getting to that realization of like the more the more we get to know ourselves the more we get to like ourselves the more we like to the more we get to like ourselves the more we become loving of who we are and what we're yeah. here to do in the world yeah thank, Love you. That. thank you for sharing that that's something parents do a lot of times also trying to be trying to protect their kids but you'll see this often with loving parents you know just good loving parents who want their their kids to grow up and not be not be hurt or not feel like they're not good enough for something and so they'll tell kids things like um well yeah that's that's a good dream but you know why don't you get a real job and just do something that you know don't don't have these pie in the sky dreams don't think too big just you know focus on what's achievable so you're not so you don't get your feelings hurt and those kids end up feeling like, you know, maybe the, maybe the kid's got an entrepreneurial, sp- entrepreneurial spirit where they want to go out and do something to change the world. But their mom or their dad has said, well, you know, you don't want to, don't risk it. Just, you know, play it safe. Make sure you're not, you know, not getting out there, putting yourself out there too much. You don't get hurt. And so the parents have instilled that trying to help the kid and ended up screwing them up where, where the kid now has started a successful company and, and still feeling like, who am I get, who am I to get up on stage and talk to all these people, you know, yeah. you know, they hear that echo in their mind. So. Right. Yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, as a parent myself, I, I absolutely, I totally get it. And I know parents are coming from this place of like, we want to protect our kids from, you know, um, from rejection, from, you know, like lack of success, but it's sometimes it's, it's actually the parent that's, um, projecting their own limiting beliefs onto their children because you know if that child wants to go up to be an entrepreneur a public speaker you know in the limelight if that parent felt like they could never do it they will naturally feel that their child can never do it as well and sometimes we just need to heal our own you know our own trauma our own limiting beliefs and, and 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 really do the inner work so that when we do show up for our children and other people in our lives you know we're we're coming from a place that's uh um, a place of a place of love <laughs> so um yeah no um so I guess I want to talk to you a little bit about your your uh, motivational speaking how did that come about is that and how does that like did, did that come about from just the childhood that you had and and wanting to really um, be something different for people or to, for them to not suffer or have the pain that you had growing up? Like, no, I actually, I, I honestly didn't share that for years. Uh, I had spoke at Caesar's Palace already, you know, and still I would have never said, you know, told somebody about being abused or whatever, because I heard stuff like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, meaning you grew up with an alcoholic dad, you're going to be an alcoholic. You grew up with an abusive dad, you're going to be, an, you're going to be abusive, those kind of things. And so I distanced myself from that, didn't ever show, didn't ever share the truth because I didn't want to be, didn't want to seem like maybe I was cut out of that same type of a, you know, that, that I, that I had those same tendencies, whatever. Um, But funny thing about speaking at Caesar's Palace, I had no clue that you could even get paid to speak. I had been, uh, you know, I was running multiple retail stores. I, I owned three stores and we had licensees, basically like franchises, but um, licensees that were selling our service other places nationwide as well. And I got invited to speak at I remember if it was mobile world Congress or the prepaid wireless expo. I think it was the prepaid wireless expo, uh, you know, thousands of people there. And they invited me to speak up there in Las Vegas. And the same weekend I got a, a KKVV radio out of eight, out of Las Vegas wanted to fly me out and have me do a, 
an interview on the radio show. And so I'm thinking, I am just blown away. So excited that I get to go speak in front of thousands of people and, you know, be at this massive event. So, you know, I, I showed up, paid for my plane ticket. I got up and uh, they had booked me this ridiculous, you know, massive, sweet, big hotel room. So I felt like a rock star. I get off the plane. I had already booked a rental car and I show up and, and as I'm, as I'm getting off the plane, the event organizer calls and says, Hey, you didn't, you didn't book a car or anything. Right. I said, yeah, I've got a, got a car in it already. So oh, well, be sure to go ahead and cancel that real quick because um, we've got a limo booked for you, a private limo booked for the week. And, you know, basically anywhere I wanted to go, you call the driver and Jeeves shows up. But so I'm, you know, I'm feeling like king of the world. And, and I got back, did this speech, got back to the, uh, got back to one of my retail stores that I was working at over in Orchard Mesa and telling a client over or telling one of my customers over there, just mentioned how cool it was. Oh, what, what happened? So they had sent a box of cookies, like this $85 box of gourmet cooker cookies, the conference organizer did. And so they show up, uh, you know, overnight delivery and like, this is so cool. So I'm, I'm telling my client, these cookies are, you know, this is, they weren't very good cookies or real fancy looking, but, um, I was just telling the client how cool it was that I had the private limo and they rented this nice room for me. And, and my customer says, Oh, that's awesome. Well, how much did you get paid? I said, well, they didn't pay me. Was, so what do you mean? They didn't pay you because, you know, these speakers make thousands of dollars an hour to speak, you know, even on some of your first events, you just spoke at Caesar's palace. Did, what did you, did you tell them your, your quote? Did you give them a budget or did they just not agree with it or, no, they just invited me to speak. And I said, okay, that sounds great. <laughs> so it was at that time that I learned that you could even get paid. So I started Googling it and stuff after that. And I mean, I'd given dozens of speeches at local events and, you know, the people had me come speak about the, uh, you know, some new telecom infrastructure or whatever it was, but just started learning there, started learning there that that could actually be a career. And the thing that I really am loving now is being able to connect with people and, you know, sharing that, sharing the real story. And, and when you talk to people sometimes that maybe they grew up in the abusive situation or they're, you know, they've got these limiting beliefs because of things that they, you know, trauma that they've had in the past and they can, they can hear, hear you. I, and we've had five people now, five separate individuals that reached out either thinking about committing suicide or a couple of them were in the process, taking pills in the process, committing suicide as they reached out, you know, just needed somebody to talk to and was able to turn those around because of that, you know, sharing the same kind of stories. And so that's, it's been a, uh, been a really cool career to get into that I'd never had, you know, I've always loved, I've always loved running businesses, building and running businesses, but I had no clue that speaking was, was an, even a career choice. I just thought that was a really awesome hobby. Yeah, well, maybe it's, uh, you know, you weren't looking for it, but it found you. Yep. Yeah. And, and with your speaking, uh, who, who do you, um, who's sort of your target audience when you're, you're doing your speeches and your speaking gigs? Who, who's your avatar when you're, when you're up on stage talking? So now I get hired to speak at different types of events. And so, you know, I was just telling you, you can't speak to everybody. But here's what I do because I do speak, I do personal branding. I've been, you know, the Mesa County libraries, the, I've had different events that have flown me across the country to speak on personal branding. So on those that my target, say, for example, with Newswire magazine, when I'm promoting an event or, you know, when I'm speaking an event about personal branding, I'm talking to entrepreneurs, authors, investors, uh, you know, motivational speakers that are looking, that are already doing great things with their life they're crushing it in life and business. And I'm trying to help them build that brand and be able to share that with more people. If I'm talking to say at the healing conference or the living restored conference, I recently spoke at those ones are, are talking to people that are overcoming the addiction or, you know, mental health issues or just that lack of self-worth. So those mm -hmm. I'm more, you know, I'm not, I'm obviously not sharing the story about my dad handed me a pistol, told me to commit suicide at a personal branding conference typically, but at these other conferences, because my target audience is somebody who's been, or, you know, because the audience is actually sitting there is somebody who's dealing with that, with that emotional pain. Most of them could care less about 
building their personal brand and getting their name out there. They're just trying to figure out how do I get to tomorrow or how do I, how do I overcome what I'm dealing with right now and whatever. So that's something, knowing your audience, really talking to the conference host beforehand, studying and, and figuring out who that audience is. Uh, another one I was recently hired to speak with for Keller, uh, Keller, Keller Williams award ceremony. And they had a hundred and maybe 120 people in the room just packed, but these are the top realtors, the top closing realtors, a lot of them were over a million dollars in commission in one year. And they wanted me to come speak to these realtors. And the, the host had originally said, I'd like you to give them some tips on being better at real estate on, you know, helping them close more deals, whatever. And, I told the conference organizer, this is, these are the top of the top, best of the best realtors in the, you know, in, the, in a four state region here. I'm not going to teach them how to be a better realtor. I'm not a real estate agent myself, but be able to get up and just talk to them about connecting with people and, and how to, uh, you know, service their clients better. So I shared about the house that I recently bought and, and some of the things that that realtor did compared to other ones that I had spoke with. And you know, just again, researching your audience, figuring out who that target audience is and, and having your speech made very, you know, very well researched and talking to that target customer rather than getting up there and telling them, well, here's how you build your personal brand or here's, here's what happened with my dad. And I'm going, oh, cool, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I love what you said to the organizer, Sub Keller Williams, because it's, uh, it really reaffirms the mindset of like, you know, are you in the mindset of, the relationship business or are you in the mindset of the transaction business yep. you know i mean telling telling uh realtors who are already top performers how to do their jobs better you know that that, that that's not going to add a whole lot of value especially if you're not a realtor yourself but well and that would have shut them down too if if i'm a realtor sitting there i you know i've made a million dollars in commission this year and some guy comes in that doesn't even buy or sell houses mm -hmm. uh, you know isn't even a realtor and he's coming in and telling me, this is how you need to close leads because I watched some YouTube video or read a book on real estate. Yeah, exactly. I would have absolutely shut him down, but yeah. was able to get really connect with him by, by researching, okay, here's some, of the, here's some of the problems that realtors are, are struggling with, whether it's the, you know, the different, the changes in interest rates, the, you know, the inflation, all these different things that are going on. Yeah, yeah. Just talk sure. to your audience. And I think that that's a, that, 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 that's a great strategy because it's, it's you putting yourself in, understanding their worldview and, you know, what, what are their pain points? And I think as entrepreneurs, that's one thing that we're always trying to do, right? By creating that avatar, by understanding the pain points of the client or the customer and being able to close the gap in, exactly. in, in what it is that they're looking to, to, to do. Um, how important are relationships in the entrepreneurial world when it comes to like building relationships with other businesses, building relationships with clients? Um, is it all about relationships? I, I think that's a huge part of it. The best realtors, the best salespeople, the, the, the highest earners are not, you know, because they're doing a specific job. It's because mm -hmm. they're able to connect with people and, and love people, show people that they, that they matter. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's in relationships, the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, you know, the old, I mean, it's an old Dale Carnegie book from years and years ago, but yeah. that's probably one of the best books you could read just off the top of my head that really could help you connect with people and become a better salesperson, a better business person, better mm -hmm. entrepreneur in general. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm currently reading a book by, um, by Joe Polish and it's, uh, it's called What's in it for them. And it's a, uh, it's a great book because it really, um, it really makes you sit down and understand like what value are you bringing to that relationship? And it's, it's not about what can I get from it? It's how can I give to it? So that was, uh, yeah, yeah, it definitely changes. It changes your worldview and your mindset when you're interacting with other people. How can you be more intentional? You know, how can you show up in a way where you can give that value? And, um, and of course, reciprocity, there's always reciprocity, but really showing up authentically with the mindset of like, I'm here to serve. I'm here to leave that person better off than when I found them. I'm here to create. Um, it's, a, it's a definite mind shift. Here's another thing too about finding the right audience is having integrity. And so for example, at a, maybe it's a speaking engagement that you've been invited that you're that they're trying to hire you to speak at, but you're, it's not your target audience. It's not 
maybe it's not in line with your ethics or your morals, being willing to turn somebody down. I just had a guy recently that was, he's a best-selling author, big time, big time speaker and stuff that I refunded his money on a being featured newswire magazine. And because as we got on the call with every person I'll jump on when I'm going to feature them, we'll jump on, do a video call and we just have a connection, you know, a conversation like you and I are right now and figure out, you know, it's not something that I publish uh, like this guy, for example, was he's absolutely crushing a phenomenal salesman. But I, as we started talking, there's a bunch of stuff with the guy that it was, that it was not a, we were not on the same level as far as ethics, morals, integrity. This is a guy that would absolutely milk anybody dry. Just, I mean, he could talk you into giving up your rent money when you, when you're trying to figure out how to, how to buy milk for the baby. Um, yeah. in order to pad his pockets, whether or not that was the best thing for the client. So we, you know, we, he'd already submitted his draft. I refunded that. I had to give it back to him. Not that I couldn't use a couple thousand dollar payment. You know, I mean, no, nobody's too rich to, to be okay with turning away money like that. You know, not have it, not have it uh, be a hard thing to do, but just having the, having the integrity to be able to turn away potential clients that are not somebody that's actually, that you're not going to be a good fit for that's a big oh, important thing too for sure for sure and it's uh and, and and it speaks to your values right like if, if integrity is a core value you know and i think it should be for everybody <laughs> but if that's a core value it's uh you know um making sure that you remain in alignment with your core value yep. as i find often with my clients you know they value certain things but then sometimes there's competing values and then when there's competing values, that's when stress, anxiety, overwhelm, friction starts yep. to play into their lives because they're trying to uphold this core value. But then they're saying that this is their core value, but then they're doing something that's completely out of alignment with that core value. Yep. And then there's no congruence between, you know, who they say they are and, and what they're actually doing. Is well, that's something too, where being associated with the wrong type of people, for example, if other say, say this guy's got some clients who've been burned, see his article in Newswire magazine, you know, see, put him on the front cover, all these things and, and they're featuring, see this great article that really looks like he's a good dude, very positive, you know, all the good stuff. And I leave out the negative where, where I know yeah. he's ripping people off. Now, those potential customers, you know, and on the financial side, not to sound like I'm just like, I just gave his money back because of the ethics or integrity, but also if somebody saw that they're going, Oh, I thought Curtis was a good guy. He's writing this great article about this dirt bag that, that just ripped me off, ripped my friend off. Mm -hmm. That's going to, I mean, potentially turn away a lot of additional business too. So yeah. maybe, I, maybe I'd turn it down because I was, because I'm a good guy and ethical or whatever, or maybe it was because it could cost me a lot of money in, in future business, but you gotta keep in mind too, that if you're, if you're doing things for the short term, you'll often sacrifice the long-term results by being greedy in the, in the present time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's a, yeah. And maybe it's both, right. It's, it's, a, it doesn't align with your ethics and your values. And it's also not good for business in the long term. you know, and, and you just don't stand for it. And, and I admire that, you know, when entrepreneurs can really just stand for something and forego whatever the short term benefit is because it does have a long-term cost. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's easier for us to grab what's in front of us and to build that long-term brand, that long-term vision of what a person is trying to create, right? Because we're, we're building our businesses, but we're also building ourselves, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, thank awesome. you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, I think in entrepreneurship, I think we get into all sorts of situations, but I also think that those situations are the ones where we may take the right decision. We, we may take the wrong decision, but we definitely certainly always grow from the decisions we make. And if we make that mistake, you know, our job is to not make it again, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, learn from it, awesome. don't make it again. <laughs> yeah. Like that. Oh, no, that's great. So, um, so for Newswire Magazine, um, you, you mentioned that that's where you uh, feature entrepreneurs, perhaps some of their personal branding gets featured on, on Newswire. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about uh, Newswire and, and how that helps entrepreneurs in their, in, as they build their brands? Yeah, so we basically, uh, it's similar to a Forbes, Fortune, Inc., those type of magazines. 
yeah. you'll see like my YouTube, for example, is, is a verified channel and you've got to have a minimum of a hundred thousand subscribers or be, be famous, you know, outside of YouTube in order to even apply for verification. I think I had like 400 subscribers, 350 subscribers when, when I was verified because of being featured on the cover of Newswire magazine. So same thing, if you're featured on the cover of Forbes, Fortune, um, Entrepreneur Magazine, Inc. Magazine, some of the music ones, whatever, you're automatically a celebrity. Um, I, you know, I didn't, obviously didn't tell them that I own the magazine, I wrote the article about myself. But, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Newswire launched in 1997. I bought the company in 2018 when I still had Best Cellular, the telecom stores. Um, but originally it was just doing press release distribution, you know, back from when it was literally faxing press releases back and forth, you know, and Newswire is just their, just the website, but we, we've basically rebuilt that, you know, starting in 2018 there. And then in 20, I think 2021, 2022 was when I launched the magazine because we, basically what we're doing with the press releases is we would take these great stories, you know, filtering through hundreds of submissions a month and then sin- submitting those manually to manually and automatically uh, to different news and media outlets and trying to connect these press releases with magazines, newspapers, blogs, wherever to be featured in. And, and I'm thinking about it going, there is a huge opportunity I'm missing out on here by not owning a magazine. We've already got the SEO, already got a domain that was launched in 1997. And so we launched Newswire magazine and, uh, it's just absolutely blown up with, we've got a ton of the articles get over a hundred thousand readers a month. So it's a good way to get traffic, but that's one of the things where niching down like that with the press releases, you know, if you're doing a $49 press release, you've got to take in hundreds of press releases a month in order to pay the bills with the magazine, our cost, I mean, our, our price on that is a lot higher, but we're featuring top performing leaders. Like I said, authors, entrepreneurs, motivational speakers, different people that are crushing it. And I can share their story when it's something that's internet or when it's uh, in, un, inspirational and kind of help them to be able to really get their name out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, we can talk about getting you in there too, no, not to make this a, uh, a sales pitch, but afterwards I'll, I'll get you some information. I think you got a good, you know, I'd like to talk to you some more and see if you get a story that's worth Absolutely. sharing like that. <laughs> and that's what's nice about these types of collaborations, right? And reach outs because you really get to know it's, you can only get to know someone from their Instagram accounts and their Twitter and, you know, like you can only get to know them so much. It's really about having that, that dedicated time intentional where you're sitting down and having a conversation where you start to realize, oh, well, there's some connections or some synergy, yeah. or somebody that one can help another person. And that's why I always go back to like the, the mindset of like having that relationship mindset. You know, like it's not a one and done. Right? If you're yeah. in the business of the one and done, you probably should be in the entrepreneurial space because I think the best entrepreneurs are thriving because they are able to build these meaningful connections with like-minded individuals. Yeah. You know, and, and they're able to kind of provide, provide that value um, to other people and come from a good place. And that's such yeah. a cool thing with your podcast is you're giving people a platform just like I do with the magazine where people that maybe have got a great story to share but don't have the audience yet. And you're giving them the platform to be able to get out there and get in front of people. And, and maybe people that are already subscribed to your show or already subscribed to your YouTube channel will see somebody else's story who they would have never heard of, but you're giving that up, the ability to connect with new followers as well. That's really a cool thing. 100%, 100%. And like when you have that opportunity and you have that platform to do it, you end up connecting with people that, you know, that needed to connect with you and needed to connect with your story. Right. Like when I started in personal development, I wasn't in a very good place in my life, but it's like I heard this one person and what he said to me, you know, and and when you're listening to something, you're feeling like someone is actually speaking directly to you because they understand you and they know your pain points and they're able to help you. So, I mean, I think that when you're able to connect with someone and that's when real impact and real change ends up happening. Right. So I think that it's uh, it's super important for us to be able to have that space to connect with other people and be able to share our story so that others can be impacted. And I I guess I'm interested to talk to you about personal development. What got you into the space of personal development? Because I find like people are either totally into personal development or like not really at all about 
personal development. And like, I'm someone who's pretty personal development obsessed because I'll okay. like, I love the idea of always, you know, um, the idea of like our work is never done. We're always a work in progress. There's always room to grow and learn and become better and be better and give more and serve. More. Like, I just love that, right? Like it's, it's, it's yeah. the journey, it's not the destination. How did you get into the whole world of personal development? Well, so I had, you know, I, I told you about the story about my dad handing me the pistol and told me to do the world a favor. But I had, when I was really 13 years old, I started, we got a dollar 75 per day for, for school lunch. That tells you I'm a little older than maybe some of your audience, but um, used to get a buck 75 a day. Rather than spending that dollar 75, I'd spend 25 cents on a cup of jello or a cup of yogurt. I'd save the dollar 50. And then I would sneak out of school during lunch break some days and I would run, I mean, dead run, you know, mile, whatever, mile and a half to the, the, the local used bookstore. And the very first day I went in there and I was just trying to figure out, I mean, I was literally going, okay, should I do the world a favor? Should I kill myself? My dad says I should, you know, am I going to, am I going to grow up to be the same kind of a loser? So I, I snuck out that first day, had the pocket full of cash from the school lunches and ran to the used bookstore and I got in there and I, you know, that the person by the counter is saying, you know, basically, is there something I can help you find? I think they're look, expecting me to look for a comic book or something that a kid would be reading. And I said, I just, I, I want to figure out how to be a good person. So they're, wow. you know, so that, that uh, bookstore owner is, you know, tr trying to figure out how to help. I mean, obviously I have a troubled, troubled young kid. And so they started showing me different books on, you know, these different leadership books and stuff. And one of the first ones that I got, maybe the third, fourth book that I got there was how to win friends and influence people. And I have still got the original copy. That's absolutely shredded, you know, just, just mangled. It's got hundred different colors of highlighter in it. Um, but that's been, that was a big thing there. And then another thing is my mom, part of the reason I got into reading the books like that was my mom would take us when we would get to go visit her, you know, on rare occasions, but my dad let me go, let us go see my mom. But she'd take me and my little brother. She took us the first time we, we went to the local thrift shop, got a, got a suit and tie. And she started taking us to these multi, uh, what are they called? Multi-level marketing conferences, <laughs> like used to be Amway. But we'd get to go see these motivational speakers that were, you know, Les Brown, all these, all these guys that were living a great life, doing good things and inspiring people. And we're around other leaders as kids here. And so then I started seeing, I don't have to be that same kind of a dirtbag I'm growing up with maybe I could figure out how to be a good person like these other guys are. Wow. So that's, that's what got me into the, to, to go into that used bookstore at first and try to figure out what book that I needed to read to be a good person. And then I figured out once I got through that first one and read it again and again, you know, there's, there's thousands and thousands of books. You can read books every single day and never get through all the information you need to be the, the person you want to become. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it really reaffirms that life is happening for us and not to us, the circumstances of your childhood. And, you know, had those circumstances not happened, maybe you wouldn't have wandered into that bookstore, all curious, yep. you know, trying to understand how, how you can be a better person, what you could do. Yeah. Oh, wow. Absolutely. I love that story. So it's, uh, it was in you ever since you were a child. Yep. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So then I'm curious, what's next for you? I am. So talking about, you know, we had, I've got Newswire Magazine. We recently, I started co-hosting, co-sponsoring some different, uh, sponsoring and co-hosting different conferences, like okay. the, um, the Healing Conference happens twice a year here in Grand Junction and then Colorado Springs a few hours away. Um, so as Tawny Lee, my, my friend from another, she had, we had met in, uh, I think in Texas, Amarillo, Texas, somewhere at a, at a personal development event down there. We were both speakers. And she said, Curtis, you know, I think I'd like to start my, my first conference. I know you know a lot about SEO and branding and, you know, could you help me with this conference? I'm thinking, oh, sure. This is a sweet lady. Let me, let me see if I can figure out how to help her, you know, get this going. Did, she didn't have a website, didn't have cameras, didn't have a videographer, didn't have, I mean, anything and announced the conference date. And it was like just a couple months out. I'm going, 
Tony, we've got to have, you got to have a website, you got to have a ticketing system. You got to, you know, there is some major stuff that goes into this. People spend a year plus getting ready for a conference. You don't even own the domain name yet. And so we uh, started building this out. And then she called maybe a week before the conference and said, well, the videographer that I was going to hire just, um, they want 5,500, I think it was $5,500. Um, but but they're not going to provide the video unless we pay additional money at the end. So the edited video footage, that's just come plug in and, and shine the camera on the projector screen. It's like, I, I don't, should I put that on a credit card or should I go and forget that guy? He just jacked his price up like 11 times. Um, she said, well, do you know of any, any good video, videographers that I could hire cheap? So we spent days you know, on the phone calling all the local video companies, couldn't find anybody that was either within our budget or that was free to do that event. I had a couple of DSLR cameras that I brought down. She's like, well, would you mind? So now I'm, I'm sponsoring the event. I'm the co-host. She says, would you, would you also mind doing the videography for me? Like, okay, this one time only, there is no way that I'm going to do this again. So brought my, brought my little photography cameras down, set them up. And uh, that first conference turned out to be absolutely life-changing for so many people. And she had a couple of people in the audience. She gave a chance to get up and, and give their give their testimony. One guy that was a recovering addict and just absolutely changed her life. He's actually speaking professionally now after that first event. So it's been, been a really cool thing. But because of that, I invested in, we've got professional uh, Netflix quality. I'll show you one of the cameras right here. Um, you know, professional net, Netflix quality cameras and rather than just doing, you know, for videography, rather than just doing, you see a lot of speaker or a lot of speaking events, the video is played back and it's one camera facing the speaker from the back of the room, no mic. So you hear every chip bag, you know, crinkling every, every speak, speech conversation that's going on between the speaker. Um, so I told Tony, if we're going to do this again, I'm going to invest in some, you know, massive investment by these professional cameras. So we've got two 360 degree cameras, a 5.7K, a 6K, and a 4K camera. And we'll do it where it's, you know, there's the jump cuts and different angles and professional mic that's, that's uh, you know, wired on with them and then transmits directly to the camera. Just makes a really high level professional looking speaker reels. So did they originally, originally went, okay, I'm going to have to start another company in order to justify this expense because I am never going to make enough from, from two conferences a year to be able to, to to cover the cost of the cameras even. Uh, but that's turned into a really cool thing too now where I've got, you know, I'll fly people in here to come in, entrepreneurs and uh, do personal branding videos like on Instagram, you know, the social media videos, yeah. like like how Brad Lee does, you know, those yeah. professional videos with the clips and the captions and all that. Yeah. So I've actually got a, built out a, built out a little studio and we, we can have people come in and do those, those professional social media clips as well now. And it works. Like I've been following Bradley for years and I love how he does it because he literally transports you right into his space. Right. So yeah. you really get to know him and where yeah. he works, and how he works. And it's, it's, it's just, it's so authentic. It's not prefabricated. Like he, they're filming as he's working or, you know, or he's yeah. doing his podcasting and you get, and it's, it's also about the angle, being able to view it from a place where it's you're, like you said, not so direct, right. Like not so um, head on, but being able to see it from different angles allows you to experience it more authentically. Well, and one yeah. thing, a client that I recently brought on, uh, or that I was recently serving here was uh, Eric Payne. He's the, the founder of FranchiseSellers.com and BusinessSellers.com. You know, the guy's crushing it with mergers and acquisitions. He's, yeah. the, he's the distributor for, like, if you want to own a Batteries Plus franchise or five of them, okay. Batteries Plus connects you to Eric Payne's company, FranchiseSellers.com to do the, you know, to, to buy your batteries plus franchises. Um, but so Eric is doing the same thing. He is way too, way too busy to, you know, got business just crushing it, did not have the time to be doing, you know, posting to, to 11 different social media platforms daily. I mean, to get on, if you're doing a, a 30 second video and you get a post, do a description, you know, figure out trending audio, write the right hashtags, those kind of things. Even if you already know it, that's a lot of work every day. But so, Eric approached me, we've been buddies, buddies for years, but he approached me one day saying, Hey, do you know of a good, I need to hire a professional videographer to, to do these social media videos. I said, Eric, let me uh, tell you about my new company. 
<laughs> and so, but one of the things that we did with him was he is too busy. You got, you know, got businesses that are going to make, you know, he can make a hundred thousand dollars today on a, on just signing a single contract. And so he did not have the time to be doing, even be thinking about the questions to come up with. So what we'll do for these clients is I'll research, come up with hundred plus different questions or topics. So for Eric, I researched uh, mergers and acquisitions, franchise, all these different things to make, you know, come up with basically like podcast questions, but had, I think I had like 120 questions for him. And we sat down, we allocated two hours. He sat down and then he, I gave him the uh, remote control, the control teleprompter. And rather than just reading off a script, I'm going, okay, this guy is, this guy is a brain surgeon, smart franchise guy, mergers and acquisitions guy. All I've got to do is have a question for him. Uh, how do small businesses get funding? You know, whatever. So he hit the thing, the next, next question pops up and he can just go on and talk, you know, give this whole little speech. And we'd cut those into six or clips were between six to 30 seconds long. So in two hours, he's got over a hundred different clips that now I'll go back and edit. It takes a couple of weeks to do all the editing and, and get them all optimized for social media, the correct angles, but he's mic'd up and it's, it's really a professional thing. And now people can see that. And, and uh, he was telling me he went into a witch, witch sandwich shop one day. And one of his, one of his friends owns the witch, witch sandwich shop franchises locally here. And he walked in the guy says, Eric, man, I, I cannot take my phone out of my pocket. You know, they hadn't talked in a couple of years, whatever, because I cannot take my phone out of my pocket without seeing you every time I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, anywhere I go, you're on there, you're providing value. You're not ever asking for a sale or telling people to contact you to, to buy a franchise. But he said, I cannot take my phone out of my pocket without seeing you providing value of some sort. How are you this omnipresent with the social media stuff? And so that's a referral again, where just going, okay, you know, Eric, Eric spent two hours and now every single day he could have these clips being posted showing that he is the expert. He had a company out of, uh, what is it called? The, I think it's the multi-unit franchise conference. It's a, it's a major massive, you know, global conference between everybody looking to buy and sell franchises out of Europe. And they, they reached out on, as a comment on one of those videos want to hire him, fly him out to Europe to speak, give a keynote speech, not because they'd ever heard of him, but because they, you know, not because they'd ever heard of his, like an advertisement or anything, but they're seeing these posts and going, man, that's really some valuable insight. And now they're wanting to hire him to, to fly him out to Europe to speak at this, at this multi-unit franchise conference where, I mean, there's massive potential new business there for him because of building that brand. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And like they say, like content is king. You really need to you know, it's all about how you're positioning and branding yourself in the marketplace. Yep. And, and, and to be top of mind, you need to be out there. You need to be out there, yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, promoting yourself and promoting your brand and promoting your authority over your area, your niche. Yeah. Wow. Well, Curtis, this was such a great interview. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you sharing your journey and, you know, your, your, uh, your, your childhood and the vulnerability of you being open and being able to share that with the audience, I'm certain that there is going to be a lot of value um, that people are going to get from your story. So thank you so much for being on the show. How can people Thank connect? you so much for having me as a guest. This oh, is awesome. How can people connect with you if they want to know a little bit more about you or the services that you can provide them? So I am active on every social platform. If you can think of it, I mean, even coup in India, there's all kinds of different platforms that I'm active on, but everything is under M period Curtis McCoy. So the username is at M Curtis McCoy. You can search M Curtis McCoy on Google, whatever. I'm available pretty much everywhere. Send me a message. I, I do a lot on Instagram right now, uh, Facebook, some of those kind of things, but, or go to M Curtis and you can connect me there. Okay, great. And I know you have a few books that are out. Um, if people want to purchase your books, where can they go to find them? The, the most recent one that I, that I probably promote is uh, you go to how the number two be successful.com. So how to be successful.com. And then that'll take you there. Or again, just go to mcrispoquay.com. And that's got, got links to everything that's, that's relevant at the time. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Curtis, thank you so much. I hope to uh, stay in touch with you and hopefully we'll connect again soon. Thanks so much. This is awesome.